they're black and they're back. Crows are laying into cattle feed on a Devon dairy farm and Tom Davis is out to thin the numbers. I'm like an Andy Crow fanboy, I've got F16, I use his cartridges. <laughs> Bird barometer. With rumblings about new variants, we ask guys at the coalface what they want from the upcoming shooting season and from their guns. If your shoot closes down, it's an impact on the whole of the countryside around. The elephant in the room. Africa's giant herbivores, like rabbits but bigger, are destroying habitats and ecosystems. So how do we park the emotion and have that important conservation conversation? Plus, we have a cellular trail cam to give away and an exclusive offer on hearing protection. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Slip in under cover of darkness. That's the best way to treat birds as wily as crows. We're on site before dawn. Devon pest controller Tom Davis is putting up a hide and decoys, so he is ready for the birds when they begin to move. Uh, so basically on a dairy farm, uh, they're mainly crows. You know, they spend all their day in the farmyard and they're in the, you know, the crimp pits, the maize pits, and when, they, um, when the cows come out after milking, when they feed up in the rides, the crow, literally as soon as the tractors come through and spread the food, the crows literally just come straight in afterwards and take the food basically and they're pooing everywhere as well and they're just making a mess in the farmyard. The farmer um, did have a uh, crow scare in there but they soon get used to that so we're on for a different method today is to try and thin them out a bit. It's a slow start but Tom is confident of birds here as the video he shot yesterday shows. I actually had spare time yesterday and I was you know I counted over 200 in the field so hopefully they still come. A lot of this job is scouting. Tom drives round farmers' fields in daylight to look at what's where so he knows which fields to come back to the next morning. Back to today's field of battle and the first birds come over, high and cautious. That was a very poor start by me. Something's not going right. Before I even got in the hide they were flying around. I think I'm just all a bit excited and I was rushing and I was just stabbing at my shots. Just, yeah, it's quite embarrassing that shooting to start with. <laughs> Tom has a new gun, a Blazer F-16, and he is not on target. He took it out of its box this morning. He's about to start blaming it when a big knot of crows comes over. It's the mother load and it's light enough now for them to see the decoys and to start to flop in. Tom finds his lead and his swing, and the birds start tumbling. Now I found him, Charlie. That's a nice pair. Dropping some nice birds now. Tom shoots three quarters and full chokes, and his favourite cartridges for crow shooting are the Game Boar Clear Pigeon. Christ, I'm, I'm like a Andy Crow fanboy. I've got F16, I use his cartridges. <laughs> Tom keeps an eye on the pattern and whether the dead birds are scaring away other crows. Those, those last two are a bit weary. With the, um, like it's probably the dead birds, the wings out. So. I'll see what the next one does, if that spooks, I'll go out and sort them out. They circled, didn't they, I think. I'll see what the next one does and then I'll go for a rearrange with all the dead birds. There's wings and tails and <laughs> pointing in all directions out there. Uh, so it's been mainly adult crows, uh, there's been a few young ones, um, and one rook so far. Um, no jackdaws yet, but 
I normally find here that the jackdaws turn up a little bit later than the crows and rooks. Um, I don't know the reason for that, but I've always found that everywhere I go. It's been a strange year for birds. Normally, Tom would expect to be shooting a lot more young ones this month, June. But the bad weather in spring 2021 pushed the English countryside a month late. Some places cut the silage like the first week of May, and I get good good bags then on the crows next to the farmyards. Um, but this year, I say it's, you know, we're way behind. We've got a fox going across the field there. Obviously a vegetarian. <laughs> what care in the world? In all honesty, I haven't been here foxing since it's been cut just because I literally have so many places cut <laughs> just getting around it all at the moment. Um, but like I said a minute ago, I've got the next three nights, which I'll be out all night and then straight on to crows in the morning as well. So it's going to be a busy three days, basically turning nocturnal for three days. That has actually come from a chicken farm opposite and um, yeah, that's just, you know, I, I had a little squeak just if you'd come in. It comes out sort of before dark and have a mooch and then first light and, you know, it's going to be a crafty one. Yeah, it didn't take any attention to the call whatsoever. But they always slip up eventually. They always do. Once the fox is clear, the crows come back on. <laughs> It's time for breakfast, as this buzzard shows. We reached the end of the morning at 8am. We could stay for more, but with pressure on Tom to shoot foxes and take clients out after roebuck, he needs to grab all the sleep he can get. And perhaps he could start by bringing a dog rather than running around after injured birds. You know, they turned up, which is always a plus. <laughs> so the farm would be happy, done what could do. Um, I had a very, very rough start. <laughs> yeah, I got, got into them eventually and uh, yeah, started shooting. So what sort of bag is it? It's 33 there. We've had a few drop behind. Yeah, probably 40, isn't it? For more about Tom's shooting, find Dartmoor Deer Services on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you, Tom. Now from a pile of old birds to an old bird with piles. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The Westminster Parliament is to debate grouse shooting on Monday the 21st of June. While Justice is lining up to attack grouse shooting at the debate at 4.30pm. Last time it achieved a Westminster Hall debate in 2016, MPs demolished its arguments that grouse shooting is bad for the environment. If you live in England, now is a good time to write your MP supporting shooting. And while you're at it, why not write to Boris Johnson too, as part of our hashtag write to Boris campaign. Staying with Wild Justice and the Countryside Alliance has slammed it for its latest tax-wasting legal complaint. New DEFRA general licences to release pheasants and partridges on or within 500 metres of special protected sites came into force last Tuesday. The group backed by BBC TV presenter Chris Packham has announced plans to return to court within two days. Countryside Alliance Chief Executive Tim Bonner says the opportunity to use funds from gullible donors to drain the public purse is too much to resist for Packham and his colleague Mark Avery. Bonner argues that Wild Justice is more interested in stopping shooting than protecting sites. More Packham news and a petition to get him sacked from the BBC has achieved 170,000 signatures. The petition says, as an employee of the BBC, Chris Packham should remain impartial and keep his views and beliefs to himself. However, he is the face of many anti-hunting campaigns and uses his celebrity status as a platform to push his anti-hunting agenda. Thanks to David Randall for sending in the story. Scotland's Parliament has responded to a petition about hair legislation started by a falconer. 
Barry Blyther began the petition because a recently introduced hair protection law contradicts laws about keeping birds of prey. Barry says the Parliament's response is generic, bland, uninformed and borderline farcical for not addressing his concerns that he can't control what his raptors decide to eat while out on a mountain. If they kill a hare, it will make him a criminal. Barry urges falconers, landowners, gamekeepers, anyone who uses birds for pest control or allows them on their land to write to Parliament explaining their objections before the 1st of July 2021 deadline. This is our last chance, so the, the, the pressure is on us now as a group um, to respond to this and put in very sensible, polite uh, and factual terms um, the reasons for our objections to the legislation, why it's not fit for purpose for the hares, for falconry and for welfare, and indeed for landowners, estate managers, upland communities, commercially, etc. Uh, we need to put this case forward now because we've got Parliament engaged. Parliament has directly responded for the petition. This is our time. There's to be a crackdown on livestock worrying in England and Wales. The government is bringing in the new measures through the Kept Animals Bill, which introduced to Parliament this week. It also includes new powers to tackle puppy smuggling, a ban on keeping primates as pets, and clauses that will force zoos to contribute to conservation. Police were called out after reports of gunshots in a town in Suffolk. Shots were heard near the centre of Stowe Market, prompting the dispatch of an armed unit. However, they soon realised it was a clay pigeon shoot that they say they were not aware of. It's not a legal requirement for clay pigeon shooters to tell police about a shoot, but a red-faced police spokesman said it would be a good idea if they did. Londoners are hopefully learning the dangers of walking their dogs too close to deer in London's parks. Deer attacks are apparently on the rise. This dog walker ends up running for his life in Bushy Park after deer reacted and was filmed by Londoner Lewis Newman. Around 300 red calves and fallow fawns will be born in London's parks this summer. Meanwhile, Westminster Magistrates Court ordered a Conservative MP who lost control of his dog in Richmond Park to pay more than £700. Danny Kruger's Jack Russell puppy, Pebble, was off the lead when it caused a stampede of nearly 200 deer while out for a walk in March. The Guardian is trying to blame hunters for the disappearance of Denmark's wolves. A study has shown that the number of wolves living there since a pack crossed the border from Germany in 2017 has halved. The newspaper complains that the animals are thriving in other parts of Europe, where a substantial number of them live off livestock, angering farmers. Researchers don't know where the 12 out of the 35 wolves are, and according to The Guardian, being shot by hunters is the only plausible explanation. Vegans have taken to city streets across the world for their Animal Rights Day. A group called Our Planet, There's Two, organised demonstrations in cities including Lisbon, Warsaw, Los Angeles and Truro. The group wants to replace all farms with animal sanctuaries. A judge in the US has overturned California's ban on assault rifles. The guns have been banned since 1989, which Judge Roger Benitez of San Diego said violated the US Constitution's Second Amendment right to bear arms and deprives Californians from owning rifles allowed in other states. Benitez says that firearms deemed as assault weapons are fairly ordinary, popular modern rifles, and he likened the popular AR-15 to a Swiss army knife. Frightened terns abandoned 3,000 eggs after a drone illegally crashed onto the beach. The departure of the birds marks one of the largest scale abandonments of eggs ever at the coastal site in California. Two drone operators sent their craft illegally over the Bolsa Chica Ecological Reserve and one of them went down in the wetlands. Fearing an attack from a predator, several thousand terns abandoned their ground nests, according to the State Department of Fish and Wildlife. And finally, one of Belgium's top sappers is retiring. Magawa, the landmine detecting African giant pouched rat, won a gold medal for its heroism, detecting landmines in Cambodia. The landmine charity that trained it and used it says it's slowing down in old age after a career where it sniffed out 71 landmines and dozens more unexploded items. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts.
Thank you, David. Next up, here's a word from Mossberg. Right, before we talk about game shoots, let's talk about Field Sports Nation giveaways and what our happy band of 1,500 supporters are winning this week. This week in Field Sports Extra, I held a draw for this Crossman 2300T, a £200 air pistol. Next week's draw, which our supporters are already entering, is for a Spy Point Link Micro LTE Trail Cam, also priced at £200 and kindly donated by Bailey's Countrywear, the excellent high street gun shop in Hensford, Staffordshire, which can also be found online. And there's a link to it in the description below. So, how do you enter? The quick way is to watch Field Sports Extra, the show we put out on Tuesdays for our supporters from the Field Sports Nation. There's a link in the description below on how to join them. Next, have you booked any game days for the 2021-2022 season? We're hearing that there's great demand, but there's also some nervous guns out there worried they may lose their deposits, possibly for a second year. Are you thinking about the shooting season yet? Possibly not, but there are plenty who depend on your custom who are. Game rearers and game keepers are thinking of nothing else. Of course, many will still be licking their wounds from last season, the season of Covid. We've certainly heard of gamekeepers who have lost their jobs, their trucks and their homes in the carnage, as well as shoots going under or struggling with debt. Jason Mayhew is a professional working dog trainer. We filmed with him a few years ago on a wet, walked up day. He's now running a shoot on a new estate and today he's helping us with some filming for Harkilo Clothing. He has found that Covid has changed the way the game bird business operates. So this year we're far more confident in where we are in the situation. But in terms of rearing and collecting birds, there's been a massive change in the view of how we get our birds. So whereas before a deposit was taken as and when the rearers wanted it, right now they want 50% upfront non-refundable. So this has a knock-on effect for us. So therefore we've gone back to the people who bought the days with us and asked for the same terms and conditions. There is a bit of hesitancy because uh, in the world it's always been a nice handshake and things like that. And what we have found is a few gripes, through grumbles, but this is how it is. Things have to evolve and we have to protect ourselves. And so do the game readers. Right. The other thing is those guys Jason's the bookings end, are strong, but shoot uh, operator we'll James Davis yeah, Cook, who we'll runs Guizani right Estate in Flintshire, yeah. North Wales, feels that some guns are being super sensitive to what they're hearing on the news. He said, oh, I'd love to take a 250 bird day or whatever. I was like, great, fine. He said, what's the crack? And I explained everything. I said, look, I won't hound you for any money now. In May, when my costs start coming out, I'll, I'll speak to you and, and we'll, we'll get it sorted. I'll send you an invoice and, and a way to go. And then we did this. And then he just sent me an email back saying, um, lockdown, won't be able to get into Wales, can't do it. And I was like, well, and that was one chap. Another chap um, said that he was going to front the day for all his pals and then proceeded to tell me that they wouldn't pay their deposits. So it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't for his pals. But um, yeah, you know, different situations. And I like to say, I know money's tight. It is tight. But I do think that guns need to invest in their shoots, is what I'm trying to say. Dave Whitby, gamekeeper and co-founder of the National Gamekeepers Organisation, agrees with James that this is the time to dig deep and support our shoots as they are heavily exposed this year. You know, there's a lot of small shoots hurting. They've still had to pay their rent. They've still got their costs. They've got all the fixed costs are there. And even if they haven't released a single pheasant, they've still got the outlays. So it's, a, it's really make your mind up time. You're either going to support your shoot those small shoots that have struggled last year or you're going to watch them go and you know if you end up supporting and you lose a few quid then maybe in years to come that shoot can help you and reward you with with better days and giving you a little bit of leeway where possible you may not be in a position if they're totally non-commercial then we all take a hit everybody takes a hit behind the scenes the work is already well underway for the coming season if you are worried about being stung this year, 
the message from shoot owners, gamekeepers and sporting agents is try and think long term because it may not just be a shoot day you'll be investing in, it may be the future of shooting. Keepers to a breed that needs protecting. If they go and more small shoots close down then you've got more areas of Britain that is unmanaged swamped by predators and it doesn't get that vital protection for songbirds during the spring and that's what we've got to think about it's not just game shooting it's far from game shooting if your shoot closes down it's an impact on the whole of the countryside around support your shoot support your local keeper and hope for the best if you have any thoughts on this please drop us a line in the comments below now, are you going shooting? You need hearing protection. The Field Sports Channel Shop has taken delivery of Vario Novo in-ear plugs. These are the Novo Natural, which give you normal hearing except when a gunshot goes off, and the Novo Enhanced, which gives you enhanced hearing. These are for sale at £199 plus postage. And the magic word, Vario Novo 1, all lowercase, all closed up, and you will get 10% off if you enter that magic word into the coupon area in the field sports shop and if you are a field sports nation supporter you'd be getting a different magic code and 25 percent off a saving of 50 pounds just saying there's a link to both models in the description below next elephants according to the iucn the african species are classed as endangered so how come there are so many in certain areas that they're destroying the land that sustains them and threatening many more of africa's diverse species South Africa's Kruger National Park, for decades regarded as the world's greatest game reserve, with animals including the Big Five drawing tourists from all over. But one of those five is destroying the habitat that the rest rely on. The culprit? The elephant. Look at our Look at this. Like other parts of southern Africa, the elephant population is beyond carrying capacity, and the result is this. Whole areas of downed trees. Could it be that in some areas of Africa there are simply too many elephants? So yeah, we have one of the, the knob thorns, but and this guy will probably still grow, the roots are still intact and everything is gone. But as far as nesting sites go and as far as far as, as uh, the shade go, the, uh, this tree is just about uh, uh, done. Forget Kruger National Park. I am starting to refer to Kruger National Park as the Kruger Elephant Park because they are absolutely destroying the place. Um, and, and I see that firsthand because I go there. I see that as 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 a as a as an ordinary citizen. I see how the, the habitat in Kruger National Park is destroyed because I've been going there since I was eight years old with my parents, even before that. And the effect thereof is, is that, that big birds of prey don't have nests. Small birds don't have places where they can stay. Monkeys, baboons, stuff like that have no place to go. Bushbuck and all other small game that, that live in riverine forests are gone because the habitat's gone. There is no small um, uh, uh, seedlings coming up. There is no intermediate uh, trees to take the part of these, uh, the place of these big trees that is now being destroyed. They, they are not here. And so what happens now to, to the nesting sites of vultures? What happens now to the nesting sites of eagles? They single out, for example, the, the um, acacia nigrescens or knobby thorn, as we call it down here. They, 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 they single out those trees as the trees most suitable for their nests. The elephants eat that in preference to anything else. So all those trees are gone. This place is not just for elephants. It's not just for them. Uh, they, they've got a place. Yes, of course they've got a place. But can that place not for, be fulfilled by, let's say, a third or a quarter of the number of elephants? Can they not do the good? Can they not achieve what they need to achieve in this ecosystem and have harmony with all the other animals? One of the problems in Africa is room. There just isn't room for all these elephants. The world's zoos won't take them. Local people are running out of options. One game reserve, um, 8,000 square miles, 34,000 elephants, and doubling every 10 years, when the carrying capacity for Kruger National Park is 3,500. And Kruger has lost all these, nearly 100% of all his top canopy trees. 
where are we going if we cannot manage these populations? We don't want to go out and just shoot elephants for the hell of it. What we have to do, whether the Western people like it or not, we have to go out and maintain a balance, the correct balance between the numbers of animals, the numbers of plants and the nature of the soil. And if we don't do that, we're not doing our job. Ron Thompson has been a leading figure in elephant population control for decades. The Western media labels him a trophy hunter. He says he removes problem animals for the benefit of wider wildlife in Africa and for the people who live there. I get phone calls regularly from all over the world asking me, am I this man? Is, is, uh, am I the Ron Thompson who has shot elephants? Am I the Ron Thompson who's done this, etc., etc.? You are a terrible person. And I hope that someone comes along and strings you up like you've strung up all your elephants and things like this. These are people have got absolutely no idea what they're talking about. And then we've got idiots like Mr. Gonjavez in the UK, who also thinks that he's an expert. These people know absolutely nothing. And, and the big thing about this is what we have to try and get over to these people is that at least unless this century we can work out a sustainable utilization program that will benefit wildlife and benefit mankind, then wildlife is doomed or mankind is doomed. The emphasis must be on people. And how do people, how do wildlife benefit people? And not how do we protect lion and the focus mustn't be on elephant and lion and leopard and rhino. It must be on how do we benefit people through that and then wildlife benefits tremendously. A herd of elephant of 10 or 12 can destroy a year's crop of a family or an extended family in an evening. I mean the people plant for next year uh, uh, two or three or four hectares and elephants destroy that in a night. So if you are prepared to live with elephant, even in those conditions, because you get benefits from hunters, that protects the elephant. But the focus is on humans. And that's what people don't necessarily understand. And, and, and that's what we're trying to get across. Professional hunters would come in with clients and they would hunt. And at the end of the season, they would take that money, specifically in, in notes, in packs of notes like this, <laughs> and take it to the community and say, you see this? This is that elephant we hunted there. You see this? This is the elephant we hunted over there. Tour operators in Southern Africa have found that photographic safari tourists don't pay enough for wildlife. Only hunters do. Conservation funding by hunting benefits the communities that live with them and the animals themselves. The animal rights people are telling the whole world that the elephant is facing extinction in Africa. Well, in Southern Africa, let me tell you, we have got far too many elephants. 10 and 20 times too many elephants in our national parks. So what does it tell you about the propaganda that the elephant is facing extinction? It's a blatant lie because they don't even try and find out what the situation is. They work out the strategy that they can use to bamboozle the public. In other words, it's like Goebbels. You know the story, you tell, you tell the lie frequently enough, it becomes the truth. And then you go to the people you've told the lie to and tell them, give us money so that we can make that lie go away. That is fraud. It's all for money. A lot of these organizations are making hundreds of millions of US dollars a year from telling little old ladies in the street that they must get rid of their pennies, give us your pennies, and we will save the elephant. Now try and tell me that these people are honest to goodness, people who really enjoy wildlife and they want to save wildlife, all they want to do is to line their own pockets because none of that money comes back to Africa. None of it. Ron set up the True Green Alliance partly to counter the stream of negative reports about hunting in Africa from celebrity animal rights fanatics such as Eduardo Gonçalves and actors Ricky Gervais and Peter Egan. So now we have got a bunch of experts in the public domain um, who form their own little organizations and they have become the experts that are telling the world what we have to do with our wildlife. And to me, that is absolute nonsense. The point being that wildlife management 
in sub-Saharan Africa and in Southern Africa is not as easy as it seems. It, it, it is very difficult to get it right if we really want to protect our wildlife and that goes from snails right up to elephant. We have to look at it from a human perspective and it has to benefit humans. Then wildlife will absolutely flourish. I, I promise you that. The International Union for Conservation of Nature claims elephants are critically endangered based on declines in figures dating back to the 1960s. The IUCN blames poachers and loss of habitat. There is no suggestion the declines are caused by elephants eating themselves out of house and home. Botswana, which has about 2.3 million people, has more than 130,000 elephants, which is one of the reasons it reopened elephant hunting in 2019. The community of 16,000 people in the Okavango Delta Panhandle shares its resources with 11,000 elephants, leading to conflicts. The government resuming hunting drew scorn from some of the Western media, which paid little attention to the welfare of the people living amongst these often deadly animals, even as their numbers grow. Last year we had a situation in, in, in Botswana where elephants were dying. All sorts of people went in from all over the world trying to find some highfalutin reason why these elephants were dying. And nobody took around and look, looked at the habitats and said, well, there's nothing for the elephants to eat anymore. These elephants are dying of starvation. And this is going to happen more and more. Thanks, Ben. Now, don't forget to write to Boris. Next week is the grouse shooting debate in Parliament. Now, more than ever, we want those letters going to number 10, saying what you are looking forward to in next season's shooting, hunting, ferreting, whatever you're doing. And send me a copy so we can make a lovely presentation book for Mr. and especially Mrs. Johnson. Visit fieldsportschannel.tv slash write to Boris, link in the description below. Now from Africa to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. <laughs> This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Let's start with Crow Control this week. A good film from pro-fire wildfowling in Northern Ireland about a farm where the Corvid menace is destroying crops and eating cattle feed. Thanks to Stuart Blair for rat control with air rifle on the Vermin and Pest Control Scotland channel, a hundred shot and good shooting. Tough Tyke Gun Dogs is shooting rabbits over trial dogs in this film. It's a great summer training exercise. German hunting formality at its height in this film from Jagd Bureau Car where Jörg Eberich and Kord Dreyer are out after bucks. Don't be put off by the German, even my German. Almost the opposite, a relaxed US attitude in this film by Whitebone Creations, showing feral hog hunting in Southern California, and with similar levels of respect to Germany. We're not the only ones to mention the popular culture heresy that there are places where there are too many elephants. This film, just out from Zimbabwean news agency 11 Dogs, also covers the topic. Going back 10 years, we filmed George Digweed shooting a clay pig at a remarkable, we thought, 130 yards. In this new film, the Gould brothers from the USA attempt to break their own 160 yard record. And finally, I had a lovely time with Johnny Carter from TGS Outdoors learning about practical shotguns a few weeks ago. Here is Johnny and Sasha's version of that day, including me, the OG of shooting journalism. I will have you for that, Carter. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description if you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.